Beyond the Ring, a podcast that covers all things in the stock show industry from the informative to the insane, starring Ryan Rash. Don't worry about what I'm doing. Worry about why you're worried about what I'm doing. And Dale Hummel. The G20 Summit with the world watching is the best place for a U.S. president to take a nap. Now on with the show. Welcome to Beyond the Ring. This is Dale Hummel along with co-star Ryan Rash. Hello, hello, hello. Ryan, this would be the appropriate time for you to maybe apologize for causing undue stress and anxiety last night to me. No, I did not cause anything to you, sir. The fact that you don't listen or watch what happens on the mainstream media carefully and closely is not my concern. You had the most negative views on the I did not. Race. And it was still remarkably close. Did you not tell me this was not going to work? No, I never said he wasn't going to win. When you come through with all your texts, oh, this looks great. It's wonderful. Da, da, da. It's like, um, sir. Being you- very optimistic and very positive. Yeah. And then you were the one predicting disaster at the end. If you would have left it alone when I told you this is going to be great and all good, I would have had a much better night. It's not my problem that I actually listen to what the people say, interpret the information, and know what but is going on. But it was on. wrong. It was wrong. No, my information was not wrong. Exactly what they said happened. Did you not tell me that we were going to lose? No, I did not say that. I never said that. I never said that, you freak. I, I think, said. I think you did. No, I did not. I said that all why all this looks good, you do not realize that Fairfax County, which is the largest county in Virginia and is as blue as it can be, did not report their early ballots on time. And that there was still 107 thousand ballots that could be returned up until Friday if they were postmarked today. That is what I said. Yes, postmarked yesterday. If they yes, they were postmarked yesterday, they can have till Friday to be counted. That is what I said, sir. I'm still waiting for the apology. There is no apology. What I said is factual. It does not matter at this point because now the Democrat has conceded and all the major mainstream media new outlets called it For Youngkin. At the time, this was like 8 o'clock at night, sir. (laughs) Well, we're we're just darn happy it turned out the way it did. And and I I understand it's close. And the Republicans are taking a pretty big victory lap. Too much of a victory lap. Way too much. Nobody likes it when you brag. No one. I I don't care what industry it is. No one likes it when you brag. They should be humble grateful, and press on to the midterm. Instead, they're all out there just swinging it around like, oh, I can't, I can't. They're looking at it as a 12-point swing, not a two-point victory. Less than two. Yeah, but they're they're going back 11 months during the presidential election. Here and are it, the it is facts. A big, it is a big swing. Here Even are larger, the facts. Larger New Jersey than Virginia. D- you're, we're not going to win New Jersey. No, but there's a 15-point swing from where it was 11 months ago. That That is significant. I, that I, I'm is aware not, of it, that. That's not, that's that, not going to win. That is not how to look at this. Let me tell you. Oh, it is. You, you people, should not no. even look at who's winning or losing. You should look at the, how much no. change took place. No. Yes. No. I want to win even, them all. You're not even telling people what we're talking about. First off, you're, uh, can we start over? Seriously. You didn't even <laughs> talk about what... <laughs> You just started in asking me to apologize for something dumb. For being negative. For those of you, since Dale won't let us start over and he just thinks that the world knows his brain for some reason, and trust me, not even his children or his wife do, we're talking about the governor's races in New Jersey and Virginia last night. These are the facts that Dale will not tell you. Most, mostly yeah. Virginia. <laughs> You're the one that brought up New Jersey, and now you want to say mostly Virginia? Well, last night, nobody was This is on not it. Burger King. You cannot have it your way, sir. <laughs> it is going to be my way. No. Here are the facts. For the first time in 12 years, a Republican has been elected to the governorship of the Commonwealth of Virginia. That is a fact. He won by a very narrow margin, but yet he still won. 
the problem with all this is, is that Dale and all the other bleeding heart Republicans are out there beating their chest like cavemen thinking this is going to make the American people happy. No, it's not. Be humble. No one likes it when somebody brags about winning anything. No one. And the whole New Jersey thing, I think that actually is more impressive than the man winning in Virginia. And the reason why is, is because the Democratic candidate for governor of New Jersey is an incumbent. He was fairly popular. And this Cheddarelli dude, who no previous public office experience or anything like that, came very, very close to beating him. He's not going to beat him, but it's going to be by a few thousand votes that he gets beat. But I think that's equally as impressive as Youngkin winning because Youngkin was running against a moron who did nothing but try to beat himself, and it worked. But a former governor that was popular within the Democratic Party. Four years ago. Yeah, I'm not saying with the people. I, I don't know where at some He's, point. He was extremely popular with the Democrats. They all said he was a model candidate, all this other stuff. But they, they must have known when they sent that many of the higher ups in the party to go campaign for him that this was a problem. No, I'm sure they did. But the man literally on the debate stage said that he was not going to allow parents to tell him or teachers what needs to be taught in schools. And I would say... He was dead in the water right there. Yeah. Would, and he doubled down on it. He never walked it back. He kept on this. He said that critical race theory was a myth, that it was not taught in Virginia, which was a lie. You can go to their website. You can see the curriculum. All this. I mean, he literally wanted to beat himself. He also made the comment that Trump was basically in Virginia that last night campaigning for Yunkin. Even though it was a Zoom or a... Trump never campaigned for Youngkin. He did endorse him. And I don't think this is good for Trump, by the way. Young, he endorsed Youngkin. Uh, he did a like Zoom deal the last day of the campaign that Youngkin wasn't even at or on, by the way. He did this himself. He did a Zoom thing in Virginia for people to vote. But Youngkin was not anywhere near it. He was at a different campaign rally and. Lubedon County at the time, all this. And again, I, I don't think this is good for Trump because Youngkin kept a close enough, a big enough distance away from him that he got back to suburban moms because he pushed education, but he did not alienate or reject Trump enough that he still got Trump's supporters. And not, so, not only did he not, did he not alienate Trump supporters? If you look at the far western regions, counties in Virginia, where Trump was getting 80% of the vote, which is phenomenal, I believe Yunkin and a lot of those was at 90% of the vote, which is That is, is because he's not a polarizing candidate. Exactly. I think, and, and we've talked about And that about works this great in the state of Virginia. It's not going to work on a national stage. See, I, 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 I've always thought in the back of my mind, if we could have somebody – with the policy and the ability to just stand their ground like Trump does without the polarizing personality, which I don't know if that person exists, it would be ideal. And I'm not saying Yunkin is one of them. I don't think he would stand nearly as strong there as There is Trump no did. one in national politics that can do that. And I, this is like I have said, and y'all aren't going to listen, and I don't care. This is what it is. There is a whole faction of people that never voted before, that are only going to vote for Trump, only going to support Trump, and that's all there is. And, and, and it is a huge faction of people. I, I know these people. I've heard them. i talked to them. There is no other candidate, not DeSantis, not your hot girl in South Dakota. No one else is going to get that kind of support unless Donald Trump himself christens this person baptizes him in the red wave or her and says, this is the one. And so he's not going to do that no. until he gets beat again. With, with those statements, then you're saying Virginia is not representative of the country. I do not think that it is as representative of the country as what y'all are all making it out to be. I do think people want change. I do think that people think Biden is terrible and all this other stuff. I also think 
that it's going to be close. Y- y'all aren't listening or watching what happened. This man that was running against the Republican in Virginia told every parent in his state that they should not be allowed to have any input or direction on what their children were taught. Do you not realize how stupid Under- that is? I understand that. Explain then New Jersey, a 15-point swing in New Jersey. Explain the, the I believe- That's there taxes. Was a- there was a flip in, in Seattle and in, in the city The deal of in Seattle. New Jersey is over taxes. I, w- I would agree with that being very likely. I, I, there, there, to me, there's, there's an, there is no question, irregardless of what you try to say, that Biden's policies, in, and you did mention the fact they want change, there's no question that's a big part of it. Now, the fact that Youngkin was likable and that taxes are stupid high in New Jersey, which they're about to be across the country and this Biden bill God that's going to win New Jersey is going to increase that that was the big thing in New Jersey was he's going to increase taxes more and the Republican Cheddarelli dude was for slashing taxes the Trump policies work we know that it's very obvious Trump is a polarizing figure some people are never going to vote for him there is a whole bunch of people that are only going to vote for Trump I think right now we are 10 months into Biden's presidency. And no, I don't, because if they were so mad and so fed up and so whatever, it wouldn't have mattered to everybody. Republicans would have swept everything. In Austin, Texas, in Austin, Texas, they voted to not increase funding for police. So things did not, it did not all go swimmingly. It went very well, but it didn't go nearly as well as Dale and all these other people want to make it out to be. Give them three more years of this, be a different story. How did defunding the police in Minneapolis go? 54% against. That's not near enough. Considering they're the crazy spot. 50, only 54% voted to not, abo- not defund, abolish the police department. With, without a clear path on what they're even going to replace it This with. is not defund. This is abolish the police department. Yeah, I, I was... I was shocked it was not more. There is so many mistakes being made. And, and I, I'm going to take a broader look at this. And, and I'm not even going to go Republican versus Democrats. Those are just names that we put on political parties. And these parties over time will change their views and, and swing back and forth one way or another. And history has shown us that. Sometimes people don't realize they've changed and where they're at, just like the Democrat Party right now, going as far to the left and socialism as you can at the moment. Maybe that wasn't the case four years ago, 10 years ago, whatever that is. I think, Ryan, this is more about it. And this hit me harder. And I've known this for a long time, but I just want to bring it out. It hit me harder when I was watching the election last night. It's more about rural America versus those that live in the larger cities. They have very different views on the direction they would like the country to go. And there is very, very strong divide there. I'm not saying that they strongly dislike or hate each other. They just think very differently. I can assure you my views are different than the majority of the people in Chicago. And it just is what it is. And I'm sure it's been this way for a while, but I think it has gone to extreme levels right now. And if there is a true divide in this country, I'm not even going to say Democrat, Republican. I'm going to say, I guess you could say more conservative view versus a more liberal larger city view. And I'm not saying everybody in the city is that way or everybody in the countryside is that way, but there is a majority of them. And it's a very, very clear, very distinct divide between rural America and the populace in the cities. This to me is a problem. And at some point there's going to be a trigger that that comes about and, and maybe it's this massive tax and spend bill. Maybe it's an election that's so close. And then all of a sudden all these mail-in ballots get a strong dump and it flips the other way. Like right now, what if Virginia happened to flip back for McCullough, I think that would be an uprising. I think people would, would go crazy over it because everybody's declared I, something like that. I'm not saying that. Something like it would be the trigger. What you're saying about rural versus urban or conservative versus liberal, yeah, that's true, but that's been there forever, Dale. I but mean, I think it's, it's much, much stronger right now, and I think there's more of a divide, and I think it's people are more sensitive to it at the moment. I don't feel that as much. I, I, I think here's the issue. I think, yes, if something like that, if the 107 ballots all 
were postmart yesterday and came in and they tried to give the Virginia governorship back to the Democrats, that would be a huge problem, but they're not going to do that. And the reason they're not is because CNN, MSNBC, and every other, all those liberal networks called it for Yunkin. Until they called it for Yunkin this morning, they were probably still thinking about how they could get out of this. But when they finally just said, no, it's done, it's over, that that's what I don't think most people realize is the mainstream media has a way bigger effect on who wins elections than most people know. Most people think it's about people c- counting ballots and all that other stuff. And yeah, it had, that has a large part of it. But when those people make the call, everything stops. I would agree. Once that call's made, it's it from a populist standpoint, it's pretty darn hard to reverse. I'm not yes. saying it can't be done, but, but very, very it difficult. stops. Everything stops. The wheels of motion stop. I don't people don't get that and don't realize that. The biggest problem with your whole theory about rural and urban and all this other stuff, I agree with what you're saying. I think maybe it is stronger now than ever. If I'm probably not gonna say this right. Do you know how much easier it is to vote when you live in a rural setting than it is in a major metropolitan city? I, I have not voted in a major metropolitan city, but I'm gonna assume it's you've takes seen less the time. lines. Correct. You've seen traffic. You've seen parking, right? You've seen all those things in major metropolitan cities? Correct. Okay. So I'm going to ask you again. Do you know how much easier it is to vote in a rural area? I think it should be, I think it should be more difficult everywhere, and there should be more skin in the game. You so are I'm, missing the whole I'm point okay of that. what I'm saying. I don't think because you have to stand in line is going to stop somebody that wants to vote from voting. It is. I think somebody that could give a shit less. A hundred times easier to do it in a rural community than it is in a major metropolitan city. And yet, major metropolitan cities control a vast majority of the elections. Because, for example, in Illinois, they have the populous base. We we, we can take the entire state and of yet Illinois it is, versus Chicago. I know. And yet it is way more difficult. You can put traffic, work, parking, lines, all these things in there. Way more difficult to vote. In one of the, and yet voter turnout is higher. They're more involved. They're more vocal. All of those things. That is a problem. I, I would like to see the numbers. I don't know that that here and I, and I can just take Illinois. I'm more familiar with it. I'm going to venture to guess that statistically, the rural vote from a percentage wise is comparable to say Chicago. We just have so many more people in Chicago that it throws it the other way. If you have more people in Chicago, I, that didn't even make sense. If you yeah, first there's just more people, said there's more people in Chicago, so they're irregardless of what the statistics are on the percentage of the. What okay, I'm saying so is then I the would, rural vote percentage doesn't matter because. There's just more voters in Chicago. Correct. So that's why I'm that's saying it doesn't at. make sense. No, I'm saying that there's nothing we can do about it. No matter how much we get out the vote, at this point in Illinois, we can't we can't flip it statewide. You've made my head hurt. Unless Chicago didn't show up at all. You have already made my head hurt. There, there's, it's very simple. There's, there's more numbers coming from Chicago than there is the rest of the state, period. Okay. And you could throw East St. Louis and a few of those, I mean, a few of the other cities in there to, to make that up, even even Peoria and probably Champaign to a certain degree. But yes, let's let's move on to a couple other things that we, we have well, to hit. Before, because like you're missing, again, the biggest picture of all this. But anyway, so after the Democrats had a terrible night, they did. They had a terrible night. Nancy Pelosi today comes out and doubles down that nothing is going to halt on infrastructure or the Build Back Better plan. In fact, she doubled down because she added back in, which they had scrapped this previously, four weeks paid medical leave, all this other stuff for businesses. Manchin, who is one of the two senators that are holding out on all this, specifically said he would not support the bill with that. They took it out. Now they get these big losses that are you know, flipping heads at CNN and MSNBC and all this other stuff. She puts that back in today. This is my point. I think the biggest problem with the Democratic Party is they do not listen to the voters in America. 
if this happens to you like it did last night and you are that party and you're the people that hold the power in that party, you stop, you take a breath, you rethink. You may not change anything, but you do not come back in a bulldozer the next morning and say, nope, and we're even going to go stronger this way. But they did. And I think Manchin will dig in deeper. I'm hopeful that he'll dig in deeper because of that, because of the results in New Jersey and Virginia, all those. And I'm going to venture to guess, and I don't have the numbers, but would you not say that West Virginia is probably closer than what Virginia was, or for sure New Jersey, in terms of being a red state? Uh, The the upcoming election, I should say. West Virginia is red other than Joe Manchin. I mean, yes. they voted for Trump by like 20 points. So, I mean, you would think that Manchin, he, he, when he came out and spoke last week, he, he is aware of these things. And he is more but aware. But Manchin is the most popular politician in West Virginia, Barnett. Period. And what if he signs on to the tax and spend bill? Then what happens? I, I don't know. But obviously, he's leery of it or he wouldn't be holding out so much. But I, I fear he's going to cave. I, I hope I'm wrong. You just said that you said that he was going to dig in deeper. Now you say he's I, I, that is what I you, hope he do, does. Do I do you, not know what, what he's going to do. What medicine are you on today? <laughs> you, you just talked about how we you the Democrats should literally have, just flip flop no, on things. Fifteen. I'm telling today. you what I want to happen. I can't get in his mind and know. Manchin's going to dig in deeper. Oh, he's going to cave. He's going that to dig in deeper. That was in like. 60 seconds of each other, those two states. Did you not earlier say that Virginia, that was that was uh, not represented the country? So Nancy Pelosi, maybe she's right. Did not say it was not representative of the country. What I said, I don't, sir, I don't know that it's representative of the country. I, I would I say probably not as much as that other I think states. You and other Republicans need to beat your chest less, be humble more. I have not. I, I'm I'm as you open started to, to all out this. this thing with me wanting to apologize to you for something correct, stupid. So don't tell me that, you're not beating we were, your chest for saying that Virginia was going to go blue, which you will I not never own said. I never said Virginia was going to go blue. Never. Oh my! That it was going to be stolen. I said there was a possibility. I did say that. I, I would have to say I was I was concerned about it as well. I did and, say that. And, and I, I, that, I don't, I'm a little surprised that it's as close as it is and we didn't have more issues. Maybe those issues will come up. Maybe, maybe there were things in place that, that weren't completely above board. There just wasn't enough. Okay, I, I, I don't have 25 the answers minutes to on things. this. So what, what else do you okay, need to talk about? Inflation. Do we, do we, do we still have people like Mr. Biden, our president and Nancy Saying it doesn't exist. It's not does doesn't exist. You don't you don't need a graduate degree in economics to understand the basis of inflation. The more government spending, the higher inflation is going to be. It's really really that simple. I promise you. When people go to the gas pumps, those people in Virginia, those people in New Jersey, went to the gas pumps and to fill their car up, they're in that 70, 60, 80, somewhere in that range to fill their car up. If you had a truck, you're over a hundred dollars. They notice those things, and I I see nothing maybe maybe you can shed light on it but do you see any change between now and a year from now with gas prices we we are not going to become more energy independent between now and then no i i don't know if there's going to be a huge change i think that something's gonna have to give a little bit they're gonna have to get it under control somehow and i'm not saying that he's gonna do it within the united states but i know he was begging OPEC and other people at the G20 deal, whatever, they're going to have to get it down somehow or they will be slaughtered in the midterms. Exactly. And what has OPEC always done in the past? They, they've always limited supply to keep those. I mean, they're, they're going to get to keep the prices up as best they can. I don't think they're going to listen to any of Biden's pleas. So, yeah, I, I'm, I guess, do I hope for high gas prices? I, I never want to hope for that, but it's definitely got the attention of the voting populace. I, you, I think one thing that will be a big effect is the holidays are coming up and coronavirus isn't nearly whatever. There are more people are going to feel a lot more comfortable traveling and going places and doing things this holiday season than last holiday season just by and large. And so I think that when they see how much more expensive it is, because like the people in our industry, and again, you're talking about rural versus urban stuff. We use gas a lot more than other people. Cause we go to shows every weekend. We haul, we look for things. 
we go we spend money in hotels we do all this okay there's a almost half the country that does that a lot far less than what we do okay but during the holiday season their eyes are going to become more open to that it's not just gas it's not just hotels everything for that you buy to make for food for these holidays it's going to be more expensive regardless what it is it's so I think this holiday season, that is going to open a large portion of people's eyes that, like in Virginia yesterday in exit polling, 60% of them said the economy was good. Uh, and like 65% said that nothing had affected them, their finances and their family were holding steady. So that's a real thing that people aren't seeing how bad it is yet. But I think the holiday season is going to change some of that. See, I, I think they're, I think they're seeing it. Yeah, we not. I mean, they they talk about Thanksgiving being the most expensive ever to prepare that meal, so it, it's there. Inflation's all around us. I, with the direction we're going, I don't think that Oz or Biden's policies could could reverse things if they wanted to at this point and and get it done very quickly. Well, and the two that they're pushing are not going to do it. It's just going to make it worse. But he's going to have to do something to get a handle on of it, or they are going to get slaughtered in the midterms. I mean, Agreed. slaughtered. The last time Nancy Pelosi was speaker, she lost 63 seats in the House. She lost seats. That's the highest ever. If they don't, if they keep going the way they're going, it's going to be more. One more thing before we get the main topic. I'm running long. We have to address the crap, and you put a post up about it, the $450,000 for the illegal immigrants that their families were separated when coming across the border illegally. Mm -hmm. Please explain this to me, Ryan. How is this so, possible? During the Trump administration, if you broke the law to come into this country illegally, let me put that, a foreigner breaks the law to come in here illegally and you were separated from your family, the Biden administration. It could be the kingpin of the drug cartel. His it family doesn't matter. coming across. No, that makes no. It could be MS thirteen gang. It does members. not matter. It does not matter. No. The Biden administration is floating around the idea of giving them four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So now, one thing people aren't thinking about, and I didn't put this in my post because I didn't have it researched out in fact enough. If it's a mother and father, they can get $900,000. Yeah, it is per person. Yes, it is per person. I, and again, this is infuriating. It is ridiculous. It is absolute total bullshit. But I want to put this in perspective for you people. If your wife, husband, next to kin, whatever, dies in active duty military service protecting this nation and its legal citizens... The death gratuity is $100,000 to a max of $400,000. So, therefore, a foreigner that breaks the law gets more money than your loved one that died serving this country. Also, another note, most of the victims' families from 9-11, the average was $250,000. And that's even for people that die for side effects like cancer, from first responders, all that other stuff on the effects of 9-11. Again, a foreigner who broke our laws entering the country is going to get a bigger check than those people do. And these people lost loved ones dying and defending our country. And I think he can do this by executive order. I don't think he has to have. What it, what it appears to be is a settlement. He's trying to make the case it's going to cost more in legal fees to fight it, which I, I, I don't know if it will or won't. I'm sure the way the government operates, it probably will cost a fortune in legal fees, but it's not something that can be done. And I think that it's gained enough attention from the press that I would be shocked if they push this through. But I, I've been shocked other times. I am hopeful. I'm going to use the word hopeful, Ryan that it does not happen. That doesn't mean I don't think it will. I'm just hopeful that it doesn't because it will it will cause further and further divide. There's no question on that. And again, but I don't know. Like, I, I, this is a real thing. It's out there. It's gotten resistance and blowback from both parties. But that's why I am pretty positive 
He's not looking for support on the issue because he doesn't have to have it. He can just do it. I, no, he doesn't. It just, I, I, I still don't understand how that, that is possible. How could they even think that idea is going to float with the American public? Again, I need to know who Oz is. <laughs> I, I, I suppose. It's not Sleepy Joe. He can't even stay awake through the G20 <laughs> climate deal. Who he says it's the most, he was quoted about how it's the biggest danger to our country, our world, all this other stuff. He got asked a question about defunding police and all that stuff. And he's like how climate change is far bigger danger, all this stuff. Yet he falls asleep in the first 30 minutes of listening to somebody else talk. I'm sure it was boring. I, I'm not arguing that, but we have the okay. world watching. <laughs> That's not the best place to take it. It's not an excuse. <laughs> no, it's it's unbelievable. It, it's so far out there, everything. And we don't even need to mention all the crisis that we're in right now. It just compounds. And one alone would be- Border, inflation, economy, yeah, jobs, crime. supply chain, Afghanistan. Uh, do you need Sleeping at the G20. So all, all of those things are going to compound. So yeah, current events. With that said, Ryan, we went a little long. We knew we would, but we probably ought to try to, to have a Beyond the Circus and we could we could dive into these. Even I don't deeper. even know how you want to have a Beyond the Circus because I couldn't even get through current events without you contradicting yourself 45 times. No, that is incorrect. Okay. You're not listening. No, I'm listening. You, your you head, you the, never, voices, never the voices in your head are literally saying different stuff, sir. Especially today. Okay, let's let's go on to a main topic that I don't think will be that controversial between you and I and God, maybe I others not. out We've there had enough listening. This morning. Okay, before we go into the main topic, thank you goes out to Boxel Manufacturing for your continued support of this podcast. I ask our listeners to give Boxel Manufacturing a look when searching for a show box or a blower. Um, it looks as though Mr. Boxel has positioned himself as campaign manager for the Rash Hummel Ticket 24, from what I can tell. With that said, I need to bring up that there will be Rash Hummel 24 t-shirts at the North American International. They will be at the Cowpokes, Western Wear, and I, I believe available from day one that they, they get there. So all of those that are showing down there, feel free to stop in at Cowpokes. Remember, $5 from each t-shirt sold goes to the Beyond the Ring Junior Livestock Association great cause so please please give your support there if at all possible and mr boxel thank you for organizing that and in continuing to support both the beyond the ring podcast and the junior livestock association and i want to give a shout out to our region three goat sponsor jeremiah hill and the roof depot they are very excited to sponsor region three goats for the texas oklahoma kids roof depot is a texas premier residential and commercial roofing contractor they are a GAF Presidential's Club award-winning company, so you can be sure that the quality and installation done by the Roof Depot is the best available, and they wish all the BTR JLA members good luck in the next year in 2022, and good luck to his kids, too, because they are signed up and looking forward to it. Are you ready for the main topic? Well, since I picked it, I'm always We ready. added to it a little bit, maybe. No, I think you I'm changed it, as like you I'm always do. An appropriate title, Managing Show Stock Weights 101. And I'm going to put this 101 into- 101 was much more fun. I'm going to put this into two, two categories, but we, we can break it down into feeding to an appropriate weight for a targeted show and basically turning in your weight declaration at the show. So we, we can kind of talk about both of those, and I, I don't care which direction we, we go first. Well, since you've changed everything and you're the one that's having some arterial flow problems today, please, by all means, lead. I would like to just bring out what, what sometimes concerns me as much as anything in when we're selecting an animal or picking out that show project for the, the upcoming show season, a lot of times we'll discuss, well, where does this one fit in if we're looking at a goat to go to Houston or a steer to go to San Antonio? Are we trying to hit the light to division one, division two? Where where are we going to go? And oftentimes we put something in our head that we hope this is this is our goal. This is what we want to hit. And sometimes animals maybe don't feed like we we predict they would. And I've seen all too often across species, we try to fit that animal into what we have in our head for where it should be in a division long ago rather than maybe where it actually fits. So I I would like to encourage people to feed that animal 
to make it look its best rather than be more concerned about what weight break it or what division it falls in. I understand if we have a weight limit on the top or bottom side, we have to fit that window. That's, that's obvious. But rather than let's say we've got, we've got an animal on feed that we thought was going to be a division one and, and it's taken off and grown and, and doing really well. And if we pull back, we're going to lose some, some muscle. We're going to lose some bloom. Maybe let's let it slide into division two and, and look a little bit better than, than if we had to hold on that animal a little bit. So I, I would like to emphasize, please, please think about it rather than, than trying to target a specific weight at a specific date. Let's feed to make them look their best. Well, I think there's a lot of logic in that, but I, I also just want to bring out, and I think it's probably way easier on the cattle end than any other thing. And I, I'm going to be the first to tell you, I've had people come up to me and say, hey, I want one for like class one or class two or Fort Worth, or I want to be in class one of one of those exotic deals at a slick shared major show. And I can go out and find cattle that fit that pretty easily. I don't have to find, I don't have to buy one and feed one, but you find a little earlier maturing, a little quicker pattern one and all this other stuff. I can fit that. And it, they don't have to change the feeding part at all. And, but I think that's a lot easier to do in cattle than it is the other species. And I think, I think it's, I, I think we can do the same in the lambs and the goats, maybe a little harder in the pig thing. But yeah, I mean, I'm going to say 80% of the time we can probably get that done, maybe even more. But, but those occasions. But I'm saying you can do it with selection instead of starving. Yes. One. No, I, I agree completely. It's those outliers that maybe we missed for, for some reason that just, just decide they're going to take off and go. But if we're. But I agree with you you maturity that, we're right. good i agree with you that if just because you bought one to be a lightweight or you know and that's what you have in your mind that thing takes off starts gaining weight and growing the worst thing you can do is just put a stop to all of it that that's that's a bad plan bad bad plan no be exactly so. and that this doesn't and this doesn't mean that i won't pull back a, a bit on feed at times to allow an animal to maybe not look its best for a few months to, to try to keep a weight within a range or, or to fit better, maybe its weight with its frame size or maturity. But I always, always, and I want to emphasize this, and I think this goes across species and it's just my opinion, maybe Ryan, maybe, maybe the listeners would very much disagree, but what I, I see all too often across species, when we're pulling back pretty hard going into the show, we're not looking the part. I mean, we're not bloomed up. We're not as massive. We're, we're not looking as good as we should. And more times than not, if we feed a little harder that last 30 days going to the show, we're probably going to look better. And, and, and I, I, don't, I don't think in just one given species. So if we're trying to stay within a weight limit and, and things that we, we just talked about, if we're going to pull back on those, let's do it far enough in advance. We still have time to feed them back and make them look the part. No, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, I showing all of them, all livestock, helping people with primarily cattle, but also other species of livestock. There have been times where I've told people, okay, you need to cut him back, cut her back, all this other stuff. But I think what you said the last month, I think you need to be feeding those things. I'm not saying that you have to be pushing them, but they need to be getting all that they want as far as feed. So they look the best that they can. But yeah, if you're going to hold on one. Let's try not to do it right there to where at the terminal end and market or for the biggest show and breeding and stuff like that, because they're not going to look as fresh, period. No, it just that simple. But, but I, and maybe I'm wrong, but I see this happen more times than I would like, unfortunately. Oh no, it happens all the time. So way more so than it should. Some animals we, we can, can feed a limited amount. Others we need to push all the way. There's a lot of differences, but talking about or going back to just what we're talking about, it is difficult for me myself to encourage my, my children to do it or even myself do it or other families that I'm consulting with. You know, when we talk about, say, six months before that show, we're going to pull feedback a little bit and they're not going to look the part. It's difficult for a family to go out there every day and look at this animal that's not 100% and maybe lose focus that, okay, we have to do this to get to that 100% at showtime. And, and that is a problem, making that animal look a little tough for a while. Once it hits the show barn, it's, I think, human instinct to have them look as good as they can every day. And, and that's not always realistic. I don't have problems with that. 
at all. No, I, I get it, but it, but I think it's hard for a lot of people, and, and it's difficult for me, even though I understand it completely. It's still a challenge for me to to pull them back and make them look that tough. But if we have that one targeted show in mind, and we're not showing every weekend, some t- more times than not, we're, we're probably going to have to go through that at some point with that animal. I guess I'm just cruel. <laughs> Maybe that's it. I, I and I'm not, I'm not saying starve them, but but definitely pull them back where they're they're not 100. percent They've lost their bloom. They've shrunk up just a little bit from where they could be. But it, it is a, it is something we need to think about, and I think it's across species. I don't think we are we're just targeting one species, but remember that those last 30 days, more times than not, we need to be feeding into it and do not be afraid to be a little harder than animal early on. If it's going to benefit you to be able to feed in harder at a later date, closer to the show. So those, those are the things. And and there's not a lot there, Ryan, that I wanted to discuss necessarily about feeding for appropriate weights for a targeted show, but to reemphasize, it's always to me, just as important to look the best they can rather than maybe fit in a certain certain weight bracket. And that leads us into the second phase of this. And that is when we go to turn in that weight card or declare our weight, usually the day before the show, oftentimes that that hour leading up to that time, if, if you have multiple animals and multiple families that you're working with, that is a stressful time for me for various reasons. I mean, yeah, it's stressful, but I think that the reason that I wanted to bring this topic up is because not only have I had so many people come to me over the years that didn't even buy stuff from me. They're just like, hey, this is where we're at. What do you think we should turn this weight in? And, you know, a lot of shows you don't turn in weights, but and and this is more obviously market driven than breeding driven because that doesn't matter nearly as much or at all in the breeding cattle shows, but or breeding stock shows, excuse me, but, and, and I'm just going to use Texas as an example, like we don't have set weight breaks, but we have years and years of data that we look back on, in terms of this is what it broke out in 2019. And this is what it broke out in 2018, et cetera. And so it's kind of like a guessing game. And if you've got one that you know, that you his frame, it's build, whatever it fits in, let's say the middleweight Charlet class. And you don't want to get in the heavyweight Charlet class because they go up to like, you know, 1,565 pounds and they're way taller than you. And you think you're going to get out mass. You're trying to stay safe in that range to be a middleweight, but you also got to have that thing look full. And I think that goes across species. And so that is why I thought this was a viable topic. No, I I think it is. And, and I think you and I are going to have some common ground on, on some of these things. And when we, we go to turn those, those weight cards in just for those that, that are not familiar with the Texas major specifically, not only is there history, but those books are, I don't even know who sponsors those Ryan, but usually there's books that'll go back five plus years or or several years anyway, that, that are readily available for all the, the exhibitors. And those books, when it's when it's a, a Fort Worth or a San Antonio or Houston, any of the majors, when it's a show that's relatively consistent in terms of how many divisions they have, approximately how many animals they have coming to that show each year, and a same target group of people feeding those animals, unlike a national show that has far more variation, but within the state of Texas, with those given contemporary groups that are bringing those animals to the show – those weight breaks are shockingly closer than what anybody would ever think they could be. No, I mean, it's a real good indicator, but I I think probably the biggest mistake that I see made is they have one that they either, a, a lot of times people like, well, I don't want to be in this class because all the heat's going to be in there. And they're talking about the major competitive players, all this other stuff, because everybody knows that that pig or whatever steers going to be in that class all this other stuff so they want to go a class under and they'll shrink theirs down and most of these places that have where you turn in weight cards you have way back because otherwise it'd just be a way in and so you've got a way back within you know whatever the guidelines are and so you've shrunk that one down you can't fill them back up enough to look the part 
And so it's just a no-win situation in a lot of cases. And I see that mistake more than anything else is I've got to be in this class. So I know he's not going to be full enough, but I think I can slide by. I think that's the most common error that I see. No, I, I think you're exactly right, Ryan. And, and the worst situation is when somebody comes up and asks you or you put yourself in the situation, I don't like being in that position where I can't maximize high, hydration or get the proper fill because we turned a weight card in and we're right there. We, we can't go any higher. And I think that's exactly what, what you just, just stated. That's, that is the worst place you can be at a show, in my opinion. So with, with that said, when we're turning in weights – uh, with with our family and with my my children, we're probably more times than not when the kids go across the scale on the way back, they'll come back and tell me they'll say, well, well, Dad, we weighed the same or a pound heavier than what we turned in. So we we had quite a bit of cushion there because I'm always nervous that I want to be able to to hydrate to its maximum or get that fill right where we could normally push it a lot harder and probably drop ourselves down a class. And just like Ryan had mentioned earlier, sometimes we're trying to figure out where all the heat, what class they're going to fall in. Let's bump a class lower, maybe even bump a class higher to avoid it. There's a lot of different philosophies out there. If you're going there to win that show, maybe sometimes you want to jump right in that class and try to get through that one. Maybe that that subconsciously the, the judge is going to lean more towards those deeper classes when it comes to that division champion or grand overall. So there's there's a lot of mind games that, that can be played with this. And it's interesting to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go one 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 step further, Ryan, and, and I noticed this more at Houston in probably the North American. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to the, the sheep and the goat side of things more than, than cattle and hogs. But at the North American, in that time of year, it's usually a little bit cooler, but it's a temperature-controlled facility. Houston, where it can be warm sometimes, they're obviously— Every time. Yeah, every time. But, but in the facility itself is air-conditioned, and what I, what I notice— if we weigh that that goat, say at 105 pounds, is his, his natural weight looking about right? We think, well, he's going to drop a couple more pounds probably. When they're in that air conditioned environment, they drop a lot slower than they do if they're out in a regular facility out in the environment. So we we always have to caution ourselves and think about, okay, what what's the environment that we're in? Are they going to drop as quickly as they would normally? Where where are we at? It seems like they're they're going to retain a lot more fluids, especially and hydration is probably going to hold. A little longer in that cooler environment. So I've seen people get themselves in trouble just a little bit on, on some of those things. So we, we have to have caution when turning in those those weight breaks. What about when you're advising clients, Ryan? Where where when they ask you, do you try to leave a little cushion there or do you try to push it pretty hard? Uh I am not the person that wants to push the weight breaks. I just don't. I'm I and again, it's not that it's too stressful or any of these other things. For me, there's too many components in it when you when you're the guy calling the shots, but then they're feeding and you're stalled with somebody else and all this. It is very hard if you're just there with one animal, then it's real easy to be in control of that one animal and everything that goes in of that animal. Uh, most of the most times you're in a situation where you're stalled with other people, and some of those people may be in your group, some of them may be from your county, maybe they're not as careful watching the water bucket or the feed bucket, etc. And you're in tight quarters, so there's a lot of outside factors other than okay, this is what it is. So I want to leave room always, and again, another thing is that tech. Like I- I'm going off a lot of experience from Texas majors. At Houston, I think there's probably eight cattle scales at Houston set up. Again, and it is a very, it, it's wild. So after the first couple of classes come out and people weigh, you try to find that one kid that that one hasn't peed or shit or anything since they weighed. And you take that one to a scale so you can match up to the official scale, and then you only weigh on that scale, and then you start it all over again the next day because they turn the scales off and reboot and all this. And so there's a lot that goes into it. And so for me, there are too many outside factors just to push it as 
to the level, but a lot of people do. A lot of people get by with it. I don't want to be the one that gets burnt. So I tend to leave lots of cushion. And I, I think the one, a, another just common mistake that is made a lot, you get there and the first thing people do is weigh their animal. That's completely the wrong thing to do. Get there and fill that one up as much as you can. Because you've been hours sitting on a trailer, sitting in line, etc. Get that one as full as you can. At night, after you've had all day to fill that thing back up, go weigh it. The next thing you do is the next morning, you take that directly to the same scale and you weigh it again and you calculate how much they lost overnight. That is something most people don't do. And you need to. Because just like you were talking about, the shrink level, how much they're going to lose, it's going to be different under all kinds of circumstances and different per animal. You've got to know what that individual animal is doing. So that's what I tell my people all the time. I say, I don't even want to talk to you till you get me a full weight. Then when you have me a full weight, you bring that to me the next morning. I want an empty weight. Absolutely. And as much as we disagree politically today, that that was that was perfect. And there are there's there's too many external factors that we don't always have control over. And again, like Ryan said, if we just have one animal to manage, we can we can reduce some of those external factors. But still, I, I would rather not be trying to chase down that person that just came out of the ring to try to figure out what that ring scale weighs versus the practice scale that I'm oh, weighing I'm out very because I've pushed that. it. I, I've pushed best. it so hard. I've got to. I've got to be careful. I'm not saying that I won't do it and I don't do it, but I'd rather be in a position where I have one or two pounds minimum, say, say on a goat or, or obviously more than that on, on a steer, that I've got cushion that I'm going to be okay. And and generally speaking, at the at the time of turning in those weight cards, I'm going to determine if we need less fill, if we need more hydration, where where we're at in my mind. I'm going to adjust to what I think it's going to be in the ring. And we can do that. If we have that full weight, we have the the morning weight after, after filling them up pretty good that day. Once we've got there, just, just as Ryan stated. So I will consider where that animal is on hydration and adjust. If fluids have been pushed really hard for the first, for 24 hours, and here's where our weight is, we probably don't need to worry too much. We're probably pretty close to hydrated. If maybe we've, we've pulled back and we're, we're not at full hydration, there's a theory out there that we can dehydrate these animals to a certain level. And if we come back real hard with a super hydration with lots of fluids, we may go past the hydration it normally would because that animal's body is going to hold those fluids for fear they're not going to get more fluids the next day. I think there's probably a little bit of logic to it. So we, we have to be careful. We have to know where we're at. It has the, and, 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 whether, and, and say it's cattle where we can't pump those calves. They've got to drink on their own. We really need to monitor that 24, 48 hours before we turn that weight card in, have they been drinking? Are, is it going to change between now and showtime? There's a lot of factors that can come in play that, that as Ryan talked about, we don't, we don't necessarily have control over those external factors. So I, like Ryan, when advising families, I'm usually going to leave some cushion. And you know what I've noticed recently, Ryan? When we go into that class and we're not the biggest in that class, we're not the oldest looking, sometimes... It works to your advantage to be a little more youthful. Maybe it gives you gives a judge a subconscious thought of their maybe a little fresher. I think there's sometimes an advantage to not being the biggest in class, even though everybody seems to think they want to be the heaviest in class. Yeah, I think that's a big thing. Oh, I broke the heaviest here, whatever. Da, da, da. I mean, most of those classes at the bigger national shows, the weight rates are going to be, you know, they're not hundreds of pounds apart. So if you're in that group, you're going to be fine size wise most of the time. And going back to what you were saying about, we were talking about external factors. Also, I do not do this. And I'm just going to tell you right now, like every animal that I took to a show had a guard on them at night. I mean, it may be one person that watches the whole group or it was always a buddy system, several people, but like somebody watches. A lot of people don't do that. And you don't know if somebody is going to accidentally water the one next to you and, oh, this one looks thirsty. Oh, do you want some water, little animal? I mean, you just don't know. And so, again, that's more of the outside factors playing in. That's why I always think you should leave some cushion. 
Another mistake on Waybacks that I want to bring up, and again, I know this isn't for the super competitive people, so when I bring this up, people are going to be like, did he really just say that? But I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest, this happens. A lot of people check their weight before they turn in the weight card. Do you know when the next time they check their weight is, Dale? Right before they go into the ring. I was going to say, I don't want you to say this. Right before they go into the ring. They turned it in. That's what it was good. We're good. We're safe. They don't check it again until right before they go in. And then we have a problem. Because you know, and, 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 yeah, and in all seriousness, we may have somebody go into a state fair or a family that's never had to declare weight before, and they, they just don't think through it. It, it does happen. And, no, it and, happens a lot. And I'm telling and you, I know it happens are, a lot because I have had people in pure panic. Not my group, but people come up to me going, what do I do? I'm like, well, hey, nothing you can do about it right now. Did you check your weight all week? Oh, we did before we turned it in. Okay, we've been here for five days, sir. You're showing on the last day. You just now? So I think, and people are going to say that I am way too crazy about this. If you show to steer with me at a major show, you got a full weight and an empty weight every night and every morning you're there. I, that's how we do it. That's how we roll. It is, it is not, it is, that's what you do. Uh, I, again, people are going to say I'm way over the top on that, but check your weight at least every day. <laughs> nope. I think that's good. And, and I about forgot about one thing that I want to use an exa- as an example, Ryan, and this, this falls right into that. I can use the Illinois State Fair as an example, and there, there's several other state fairs that we can use as, as examples. Sometimes in the heat of the summer, and it could be miserable out, you may have to have those animals in there, let's say, on a Tuesday, and you don't show until Friday, but you turn the weight cards in Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. Or let's say you've got a two, three, maybe even as much as a four-day window on that way back. So we need to think about that a little bit. Not so much, in my opinion, on going over, but guess what happens sometimes, Ryan? When you're, I'm just going to pick on the Illinois State Fair. At certain times, there's been no drenching allowed in the goat or the lamb barn. Okay, and we get down there and it's 100 degrees and we've got two or three days from the time we turn that weight card in until they show. And there's there's kids that show up down there that those animals have never been to a show. They're not comfortable. With, they didn't bring their own water from home and they're not comfortable with drinking. What do you think's happening to that animal from the time they turn that weight card in until showtime? <laughs> okay. they've, they've dropped a lot of weight. Yeah. I mean, they just have. And these these poor kids are getting kicked out for being too light. Now, I, I don't think that was ever the intention, but sometimes we get caught up in, in some of these rules that don't make sense. See, that's the whole point about rules. It doesn't penalize the people they want to penalize. It penalizes people, uh, other people. Yeah, I, again. And I, and I, I think. Whole other top topic that we've done yeah. 900 times, but yeah. In most in most shows in the lamb and goat thing, we we are allowed to drench. You may have to go to a wash rack, but there's there's something there, and, and I think it needs to be, especially in the summer, because it's more inhumane to me to not hydrate those animals or get fluids into them than what a, what a drench gun is going to do in terms of stressing that animal out whatsoever. And we we can do that in a whole other topic. But but that is interesting to me that if we can use a drench gun, we can control where that weight is much much more efficiently. I don't know. I'm assuming, Ryan, on the cattle side of the steers at the majors, we cannot pump them or not? Not in Texas. Now, you can drench, okay. but you got to go to wash racks and stuff like that. I mean, it's, I mean, but no, you can't use a not on the pump, Yeah, but, on the lamb and goat side, we can go to a wash rack, but on the steer yeah. side, you cannot pump. You can drench, though. You can drench. Or Just going to take you a whole lot longer. Oh, uh, if you got to put a whole bucket down one, it's bad, bad, long, yeah. long, long and, time. And, but, and to me, that's far more stressful on the animal than pumping the animal. Oh, way, way, because it takes forever, and you got to open their mouth multiple times and stick it to Yeah, it's a mess. But and there, there's going to be some steers that just are not going to drink on their own. Not, okay. not, not to the level they need You're to. Right? No, it's it happens, and but yeah, it's all very stressful on that part of it, but. One thing that you alluded to earlier that I also want to bring up, and I mean, th- this may be something that if you just started and stuff like that, that you might have to seek out more expert advice on. But while, like we talked about g- shooting for a smaller class or all this other stuff, not probably the, you need to weigh your animal where you can keep them full, keep them all that. There is also something to be said 
that there are different levels of being full and certain animals, specific animals, don't look as good when they're at their max fill. They need to be trimmed up just a little. All of those things. And these are minute details that, again, a trained eye is going to know. And that's why they're probably going to be more competitive. But I just think that we need to like put out there that the extremes are not always the best. Just because you can be this full doesn't mean you have to be that full when you walk into the show ring. Agreed completely. And that what I would like to, to finish this one on is do not put yourself in a position that Ryan and I both talked about that you've pulled that so tight that you can't get to full hydration, you can't get to that proper body fill. Because there's one thing to remember. If you do not look the part, you darn sure don't have to worry about weighing out because you're not going to get weighed. I have said that to a million people, it seems like, and not really a million, but I'm talking a ton. Like, it, it doesn't matter if that one doesn't look the part. You don't have to worry about what he weighs. So there you go. I mean, and it, ha- and it happens too often. When they push it too much and they can't get that hydration back, they aren't getting weighed. They, they shouldn't have worried about it at all. They, they put themselves in a position that they maybe could have made that scale but they didn't because they pushed it too far. And so just a lot of this stuff, I think common sense goes a long way. Uh, I know that sounds simple and stupid, but common sense does go a long way in terms of waybacks and finding the right way. But again, I I do want to stress to people and like I've had so, I mean, probably thousands of people come up and ask me that that I weren't over the years. They weren't in my group. I didn't sell them anything. What do you think about all this? I, I never had a problem helping somebody out. I mean, granted, I may not have traveled halfway across, you know, the center at Houston to go look at that animal individually. But if they wanted to bring it to me to look at it or they said, hey, this is what our weights are. What do you think? I, I had no problem helping anybody. I also never had a problem when somebody come up and say, hey, what are you running that one is? Everybody, like, a lot of people want it to be a secret. And if I know that that is going to be an heavyweight ABC, I'm just going to tell you, yeah, that's heavyweight ABC. I, I don't like the secret bullshit games that people try to play. Oh, I don't know. I'm whatever. Like, you know. You know when you went there. Now, you might change because you saw something or got afraid of something or whatever. But you know when you went there what your target for that animal was. And so that's just a personal pet peeve that I want. And that to that is there. interesting because it is very very secretive. You want me to tell you another another? I'm not, I even, I'm not even gonna call it. I'm not even gonna call it a pet peeve of mine. Just a, I don't understand the logic in it. The way my brain functions, it makes no sense. Just like on the goats and lambs, we've got blankets on them, and nobody wants to take that blanket off before they go in the rain to let anybody else see what they are. My thoughts are. What does it matter? If you've got an animal there, you're going to do everything you can to make it look as best it can, irregardless of what somebody else looks like. Just because somebody else looks better, I'm already doing everything I can. I can't right. I can't change it. So what does it matter if they happen to see your, your lamb or goat? If see, he does I wouldn't really like good. me in this sheep and goat world. If I had one I thought I was going to win, I'd parade that thing all around. <laughs> Absolutely. I think parade it. Let them stress out about it. That, that's where <laughs> that's, I'm at. I would be that person. I'd be like, yeah. looky what you got to be here, children. No, I think that's a <laughs> lot better plan than hiding them. Don't you? I mean, I'm literally the one that we go down whatever aisle is busy, the busiest to walk our steers at night. So I'm like, yeah. So Come here you at go. me. <laughs> yeah, to get around this one. Yeah. I think that does more psychologically and put more stress on them where they're not going to be able to think as clearly than if they've never seen the damn oh, thing. I know people in the steer deal that they'll get some county kid to go walk theirs around so nobody will know who's attached to it. It's the dumbest stuff I've ever what, I mean, what are What is it going to change? Nothing. Nothing. That's you what can't, it, the, I mean, people get in their heads entirely too much. This is all there's, topic. I, I've never... <laughs> Never been able to understand that. Never. I haven't either. I haven't either. I mean, it's almost like, okay, I'm I'm one of your competitors. I'm only going to hydrate half as much because I don't think you have that good one. I don't need to look that I good. I don't think I can no, beat you, no. so I'm not going to feed or water my goat anymore. Right. Or right. or I think I can beat you easy by just going part way. That's, yeah, that's probably that, not no, a good approach. None of it makes sense. None of it. I But but it's real. It, oh, it is real. It is real. Absolutely it real. Is real. <laughs> that, is, wanna, that is something I do not miss at all by the way 
<laughs> and I want to go I mean, back. I and miss watch. showing them, but that little part of it right there, the little mind game, not I don't miss that. And I'm still sure I'm with you. I think better off sh- parade that sucker down Main Street. That's how I am. Here we go. <laughs> I'm with you. I want to go back. I, I made a com- comment about the Texas majors and the weight break classes, especially on divisions, are usually going to be pretty reliable if you look at a couple of years worth. I mean, you're going to get close. I want to caution people because especially if you're used to that in Texas and you go to a Kansas City or a Louisville or a Arizona National or wherever it may be, when you're bringing animals in from across the country, you're not always getting the same families every year. You're not getting that consistent contemporary group that you would at the Texas majors that people will put so much faith in what it was the year before that I'm going to turn them in at this exact number because I want to be in this exact class. It doesn't work as well on the national stage. No, if that makes sense, that. Ryan. I agree with so that. So be, be careful with that. And, and I see well, people and I put don't, a lot also of faith don't in know, it. I also don't know if there's that information as readily available to Not, it's, every exhibitor. I mean, no, I know you, there's, I know I kept it for the, all those other shows and whatever and stuff like that. But, I mean, like I said, there's a book that's passed yeah, out published. readily available in Texas of this stuff. I don't that that doesn't happen at the Kansas City, Louisville, Denver's of the world. No, you can collect your own data, and and if you right. shop around a little bit and, and get some assistance from another fan, you're, you're going to be able to put it together. And it may be dead on, but I, I know a lot of people that get very disappointed that they pulled just a little harder than they normally would to try to catch the top of a division. Then all of a sudden, they're still the lightest in the next division up. And they can't look as good as they, they need to because they pulled just that little bit harder. I just caution people, be careful. Don't don't assume it's always going to break just like it did the previous year. Are you ready? For? Question and answer. Oh, uh, well, before we get into that, I've got one other sponsor shout out to uh, M- Maples Cattle Company in Lafayette, Alabama. They are the Region 4 cattle sponsor. Maple Show Cattle's goals always have been to consistently produce a high volume of elite steers and heifers that are competitive in the show ring from the county to the major show levels. They enjoy helping stock show families get results in the ring, and they have a proven and decorated track record of success. Thank you, Maple Show Cattle. John is a great guy there in Alabama. He's got steers that win consistently all over the U.S., so thank you to Maples. Thank you, John, for sponsoring Region 4 Cattle. Excellent. I want to I want to thank everybody, Ryan. I can't believe the outpouring of sponsorship that's coming through. It's I need incredible. More. I know you need more. You we always need and want more so we can give out more and more awards. It, but it it's has it's pretty been, darn good. No, it has been incredible. And uh I mean, yes, I do want more sponsors and I'm going to recruit more sponsors because the more sponsors I get, the more members and children get to win something at the end of the year. But I mean, like again, we're still two months away from starting, and the support for this organization has just been off the charts. No, absolutely, and in the shows that are stepping up to sanction it, and I did have a few people ask about sanctioning fees because on the forum we still have a hundred dollar fee. There is no sanctioning fee for twenty twenty two. No nope. sponsorship has been strong enough that Ryan and I had, had made that decision that it's free, guys. There's no logical reason not to sanction your show. You don't have to change anything. It doesn't cost you anything. And it benefits the members that are going to be at your show. It's very simple. I agree. All you got to do is fill out a form and then send in the results after the show. So there's no reason not to sanction. Very, very simple. Okay, the first question. This comes from Jeannie. Our family has enjoyed your podcast over the past show season. Our son has autism. He is now 14 years old and has been showing livestock since he was seven years old. When he was very young, we would tell what the situation was and that he may need extra help navigating the show ring. Sometimes they may say something to the judge. Now that he's older, we don't usually mention it. Sometimes it's hard to watch because he might get lost in the show ring, and other times he may be as high as fourth overall showman out of 35 kids. My question is, if you could know beforehand that a showman has special needs, would you want to know? Our son has already had the privilege of having Dale as a judge and will soon have Ryan as a judge. Thank you for answering. This is an important question to to many families out there. This has come up with variety of different circumstances and instances and i'm not saying that i need to know i'm pretty perceptive and can get a handle on it but i have never been upset 
about anyone letting me know of a circumstance of special needs child or even even there have been times that people have said, hey, this one coming in, not so broke, not so lost, you know, not some whatever. I have never been upset whether a parent or a show organizer or, a, you know, anybody has tried to alert me to a situation to make everything go smoother in the ring. So that's my stance on it. No, and I, I think it's a difficult call. And, and I'm like, Ryan, I, I don't see any downside to, to letting the judge know what's going on. And I think some judges can be very perceptive and pick up on it anyway. And other times, maybe maybe your son is in the ring and, and having one of those days where he's a little more focused on on what's going on in the ring, and maybe we wouldn't even notice it. So that that is a difficult call. But I, I, I certainly do not, no matter what the special need may be, I cannot imagine a judge out there ever being negative for being advised of such. Yeah, that's, that's so what I was trying I would, to say. I didn't... I don't think there's any reason not to advise. No. And I think that's great. And and I've seen so many kids and in and we have our youngest son Chase is is on the spectrum and, and there's a lot of a lot of good that comes with that, but sometimes it's it's a challenge and and we've got to provide as many opportunities. And I've seen, especially with autism, this game we call the stock show industry has been a huge plus for so many kids. Let's keep it going and let's continue to encourage those type of, of events or, or participation in, in, in the show ring. It's, it's, it's a good thing, a great tool, and, and hopefully makes a difference. The next question comes from Jennifer. I don't think I can answer this one, Ryan. Oh, great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull my calendar out. Um, Ryan and Dale, what days will you all be at the North American? I love your podcast and would like a chance to meet you. Uh... I know what days. I don't know what dates. Uh, I don't even know what days. I'm going to be honest. So, so I know I, I'm going to be there the Monday of the Senior College Livestock Judging Contest. After that, it's kind of up for debate at the moment. And, and we're supplying classes for the Senior College and the National 4-H Contest, which I believe is Monday and Wednesday. And we will be there for the Market Goat Show. So I'm going to guess I'm there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And Ryan, I'm going to guess you're probably about the same. I know I will be there Monday. And I mean, I, I don't know after that. That'll depend on lots of different factors at the time. I My personal goal is to stay through Wednesday. But I can't assure that. I can't say that's going to happen for sure. But that is my personal goal is to be there Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of the North American. What What I can promise you. All of our well, listeners that will be there. Don't you be promising something for me. Speak I'm, for yourself. I can. There, this is dog. easy. This No, this one's easy. Yeah, if you go yeah, to Cowpokes yeah. and you buy a Rash Hummel 24 t-shirt, Ryan will sign it if you find him. And oh, have a sharpie yeah. marker with you. No, no. That, yeah. That, See, I, I knew I could promise that. That I will do. Should we go a little further or no? Uh, I don't know. After you and Mr. Boxel's failed attempt at the well, National we just, we just had the National a little... We, we just had the date a little off. Skills, just but, yeah. the date was a little off, but we're we're uh, getting better at that. Okay, so we look forward to seeing everybody. That's why I didn't have anything nice to say about Mr. Boxall this week. We, we look forward to seeing everybody at the North American. Please support Kyle Pokes. Buy the the Rash Hummel twenty four t shirts. Ryan will be there hopefully Monday. Well, he will be there Monday. No, I'm gonna Tuesday, be there Monday. Monday. I promise you, I'm gonna be there that day. What's our next one? Okay. The last question, and by the way, our, our on the business Facebook page, our it's Beyond back the up, Ring. Because I was, oh, I was just it? like, I just okay. like this back up. Well, when I went to pull questions for question and answer, and I usually go to the Beyond the Ring Facebook message page, it was down. So I had to pull up the email that I don't look at very often. There's plenty there. And this one comes from Georgia, not the state of Georgia, but the person Georgia. Question for Ryan What is a piece of terminology? That if you hear a contestant say in the reasons room, you automatically give more points. There's not one that I give automatically give more points to. Uh, there, there would be several that I would take points away from, but they're not. There is not one piece of terminology that I say, oh, they said that, and they're gonna get more points. There's not any. What gets more points under me is something that not all 200 other people said that is accurate 
and fits. And when I mean accurate and fits, it fits the animal and it fits the class and the situation and what you're trying to explain in the reasons, not just that, you know, oh, I can say this about this animal, but there is not one term that is going to get you more points under me. And I, I'm, I'm going to say this too, just because I say something on a mic at a show and you say it to me in a set of reasons, that does not mean you're going to get more points. And maybe that's what she, this person was getting at. So let me clarify that. <laughs> if, if it fits, it probably isn't going to hurt you. But, but it, the key is that it needs to. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> let's, let's, Easy. Let's, let's, descri- let's just describe the livestock accurately. Everybody needs some- to be themselves. Not everyone yes. needs to try to be me. And I oftentimes hear this, what I call fake reasons voice, that everybody tries to sound the same. I'm Ugh. out. We get put to sleep when we hear that same voice. Be yourself. Use your natural oh. voice. Use oh. personality. Get that reasons listener to like you. Oh. If they like yeah. you and you say something wrong, they're more apt to overlook it than if they don't like you. I promise you that. Real yeah. simple. Confident without arrogance. Personality. And be a, don't be afraid to be a little bit different because we've listened to too many sets that day that all sound the same. No, I'm out. But you got to be you. You can't try to be somebody else. And I guess if maybe we could take it one more direction from a personal perspective, if I'm in the room, I probably want to hear more discussion on skeleton than maybe what, what I, I hear normally, if it exists, where sometimes we, we skip over that. Nick? Ryan, that's all the questions I have. Well, that's good that you came up with three without having messaged that is, earlier. We had to go to email. Now I'm going to have to dig into email and print a bunch of those off. I apologize to those of you that email, but again, Facebook Messenger is kind of the go-to for the question and answer. Ryan, it was a good episode. I hope it was educational for people. Maybe a little confusing on the political side, and we may not agree completely, but I think the main topic was good. There you go. So. Until next week, be safe. Y'all come back now, you hear?